Hi, my name is Jonathan Clark, also known as Scooter, from the replant.ca website, planting website. And I'm here to do a quick video about fuels today and how they relate to the tree planting industry. And the reason for this is because over the years in the industry we've seen a lot of instances where people have put the wrong type of fuel into a vehicle or into a piece of equipment and it's caused damages. And obviously we don't want to see companies spending money trying to fix unnecessary damages. Uh, we'd rather see the money going to the tree price, which benefits us. Um, and of course also, you know, sometimes you'll have a problem when a vehicle gets disabled and people are trying to use it, so you end up losing a few hours of planting time or dealing with getting it towed, or you might get stuck out on the block for a while after supper. So always a bad situation. So basically there's, there's two main types of fuel in planting camps. Um, gas and diesel, gasoline and diesel. And I mean, there's other fuels too, kerosene, propane, stuff like that. But let's focus on gas and diesel because they're the ones that cause most of the problems. Um, basically, if you put diesel into a gas engine, it's kind of bad. If you put gas into a diesel engine, it's extremely bad. Um, today's modern diesel engines, uh, they're very fuel efficient compared to the old days. But the problem is the fuel injectors, which keep these, help make them efficient, these fuel injectors are very, very picky, and they don't like having gas, they don't like water, they don't like dirt. Um, basically, all they like is clean diesel. And if you have to fix an injector on a truck nowadays, it's pretty close to $2,000 to replace it, and there's quite a few injectors on a single truck. So, basically, if you're putting fuel into a vehicle from a jerry can, take a look in the jerry can, make sure there's no dirt in the bottom. Um, if you're using a tidy tank, a slip tank, make sure that the cap gets replaced on the tank after you've used it um, because you don't want rainwater coming in overnight or something like that. Water gets into the tank, into the fuel, then it goes into another truck and, uh, and causes problems with another truck. So let's talk about the difference between an engine and a motor first because that's a little bit confusing to people. Um, basically, they are the same thing, or at least they started out that way. Um, an engine, engine comes from a root word in Latin many centuries ago that was ingenium and basically that meant very smart or with genius and that referred to the fact that using machinery to do work for humans was a smart idea. So from the Latin ingenium, eventually the French got the word engine and that became an English word engine and it's got other uh, uses like cotton gin that was uh, used in, in English a couple hundred years ago. The gin meant engine, so cotton engine, because basically the cotton gin was a type of machine. Now the term motor wasn't really used until about a century, and initially it referred to internal combustion engines. That's why we, we hear about motor vehicles. But <clears throat> common usage has kind of changed these terms over the years, and so generally when you're looking at an engine now, you have to think about something that, um, that transforms energy within the machinery. So if you look at a truck engine, which is an internal combustion engine because fuel gets burned inside the engine, combusts internally, um, because the transformation of the energy happens inside the engine, that's why it's called an engine. But if you look at something like, um, like an electric motor, the energy is generated off-site and it's just electricity that comes into the motor and so the uh, the transformation of fuel to, to create the energy happens outside so that's why electric motors are called motors. Gasoline and diesel both come from petroleum, from oil, they're both distilled from oil uh, but they do have some chemical differences even though they're fairly similar. Um, they smell different. If you end up working with them each you'll get used to the smell of each and for me personally, I find that diesel smells a little bit sweet almost. Um, it doesn't bother me too much, whereas gasoline, if I end up smelling a lot of gas vapors for a few minutes, I start to get a little bit nauseous to my stomach. Um, if you get some on your hands, gasoline is quite thin, and if it's warm day, it'll evaporate very quickly, whereas diesel is very oily and stays on your hands. Uh, gas does not change its consistency as it gets colder, it's very thin, but diesel does. Diesel, uh, when it gets cold, it gets very viscous, very thick. Uh, and one of the most important things is that the temperatures at which they burn are quite different. 
for diesel, diesel will burn at 210 degrees Celsius. Gas doesn't burn until it reaches 246 degrees Celsius. Uh, I'll explain why that's important in a couple of minutes. But basically, you should also know that gasoline is quite ex quite explosive. It, that's because it has a lower vapor point than diesel. <clears throat> diesel itself is not very explosive. In, in a lot of cases, you could actually drop a match into a pool of diesel and it won't light. Although if you put a burning rag or something into diesel, it will catch fire fairly quickly. Um, the only difference between gas exploding and diesel burning really is um, the speed at which it combusts. It's the same process, it's just that with gas it burns very, very, very quickly and we see that as an explosion, whereas with diesel, if you can light it, it burns quite slowly. There are several different types of diesel, but interestingly they all have very similar chemical compositions. Uh, if you look at road diesel versus home heating fuel, furnace oil, uh, versus agricultural diesel, versus kerosene, versus jet fuel, all five of those items are very, very similar, very close in uh, chemical formula. So, in fact, sometimes home heating companies, if they run out of furnace oil, they'll actually sell consumers jet fuel or kerosene and just not say anything because it burns just fine in a home furnace. Now, speaking of kerosene, um, some planting camps will use kerosene space heaters for dry tent facilities. So even though kerosene and diesel are almost exactly the same formula, I wouldn't recommend that you interchange them. In Europe, what we know as gasoline is referred to as petrol. So they have petrol and they have diesel. Uh, but for us, it's gasoline and diesel. And that's fine, but it's kind of annoying at times because people shorten gasoline to gas. And technically, gas also refers to natural gas, you know, like gas as in vaporized material. So that's a little bit confusing. Anyway, um, if you go to an urban service station, the only type of fuels that you'll be able to get will be clear fuels, clear diesel or clear uh, gasoline. Now if you go to a rural setting, a service station might have a dyed version. And if you go to a card lock facility anywhere, it's almost certainly to have both clear and dyed fuels. Now the difference is the dyed fuels the dye that's added, that's the only difference in composition between the two types of fuel, a dyed or a non-dyed. Um, it's the same fuel, but the difference is the price, and it's because they're designated for different uses. So clear fuels are designated for highway use, and dyed fuels are designated for off-road or farm use. So, you know, tractors, agricultural use, logging vehicles like skidders and stuff that stay off the road, construction equipment, stuff like that. Now, I don't know exactly the true rationale behind the pricing, the dual pricing structure, but I can think of two reasons right off the top of my head um, that might be possible. First of all, the higher priced clear fuel, that's like maybe an extra 10 or 15 cents a liter, um, maybe the rationale for that is because that extra money, that extra tax goes to pay for the public highway infrastructure. Um, another way that you could look at it is maybe the farm fuel is subsidized and off-road fuel and heating oil is also subsidized that's a dyed fuel so maybe they're looking at agricultural fuels and home heating fuels as subsidized because those are considered necessities for people whereas road diesel is considered a luxury i'm not sure but both both reasons make sense to me anyway okay so one last thing i want to talk about a little bit technical maybe not critical that you know this but you know, it's good info anyway, so I'm going to go into it before I get into broader stuff. That's exactly the differences between a gas and a diesel engine, how they work. Now, did you know a diesel engine does not have spark plugs? That's kind of weird, eh? Um, basically, the difference is a gasoline engine is called a spark ignition engine because what happens is um, there's cylinders with pistons in them and air and fuel is mixed and sprayed into the cylinder and you get a spark from the spark plug and that spark ignites the gas air mixture you have to have oxygen to have a fire so the spark ignites the gas and air gasoline and air and it explodes and that pushes the piston out and when this keeps happening piston going back and forth that's what creates the work now in a diesel engine there's no spark plug so how does this all work 
Well, basically it's called a compression ignition system. And the thing is, if you, <clears throat> if you took physics in high school, you might remember that as you compress a gas, as in the air gas, vaporized, or like oxygen sort of gas, as you compress any type of vapor gas, its temperature increases. So if you take a cylinder full of air and the piston comes down and compresses that air, what happens in a diesel engine, the compression goes to about um, 25 times normal, so the volume f occupied is 1 25th of what it started out. So when you compress that oxygen outside atmosphere by 25 times, the temperature goes way, way up inside the uh, cylinder. And then, instead of spraying a mix of gasoline and oxygen into the cylinder, which is what happens with a gas fuel injector, a diesel fuel injector only sprays fuel, diesel fuel, because the air is already in the cylinder and it's already compressed. And because that air is hot, when the injector sprays the fuel, the diesel, into the cylinder, it's hot enough to ignite the diesel. As long as it's 210 degrees Celsius, it's hot enough to in ignite that spray of diesel mist that goes into the cylinder. And then it ignites, it starts to burn, and the expanding gases as it burns is what pushes the piston back out. Okay, so it's kind of the same concept overall. It's both, you know, hot things inside a cylinder making the pistons move, but uh, a slightly different approach. Now, um, the thing that's really interesting with a diesel is if you've got a cold truck, a cold engine, it may be that even though you've got that air compressed to 25 times, it's uh, 1 25th of its normal volume, if the metal of the engine is cold, that metal may keep the air from getting over that 210 degrees Celsius. So you may have problems when you first start the engine. And so that's what a glow plug is for. And so in all diesel engines, you have a, you're, well, in cold weather, you're supposed to turn the key on, let it sit for, say, three or four seconds, and there's usually a glow plug indicator on the dashboard, and when that glow plug indicator goes out, then you know that the glow plug has warmed up around the cylinder a bit, and so the metal of the cylinder isn't so cold that it prevents that diesel from igniting. Okay, so, so once again, with a cold diesel truck, turn the key and let the glow plug warm up for a few seconds first, and then you can turn the truck over and start it. Um, if it's warm weather in July, you quite often don't need to worry about this because because uh, the metal of the truck is already fairly warm. You know, it might be 30 degrees Celsius, but uh, on a cold morning when it's five or 10 below, the glow plug's very important. Okay, so that's basically what the, uh, what the difference between a gas and a diesel engine is. And that's not really critical for you to know, but it's, it's useful information. Some people might find it useful. So let's start talking about some of the um, more obvious differences that we do have to know about. Now there are a couple ways of identifying whether you've got gasoline or diesel in a container. I talked earlier about you could, you could tell the difference by the smell once you get used to that. Well, you shouldn't have to be able to rely on the smell to tell them apart. So first of all, there's the UN classification number. And basically the United Nations came up with a system of classification a while ago. And so they have all these four digit numbers for different types of hazardous materials. So the UN number for diesel is 1202, and the number for gasoline is 1203. And you just have to memorize those. If you're trying to remember which of the two is which, think about it this way. 1202 is the lower number, and diesel comes, it's lower in the alphabet. D is lower than the alphabet than G for gasoline. So that's how I remember the one part. Diesel, 1202, gasoline, 1203. You can also tell by the color of the containers. Okay, um, gasoline should always be stored in red containers, and it doesn't matter whether it's a jerry can or a tidy tank, a slip tank, a big tank in the back of a truck. Uh, always red for gasoline, and then diesel is always stored in yellow containers, yellow jerry cans, yellow tidy tanks. Um, so a small jerry can, typically they hold about 25 liters of gas, although you can get smaller ones, especially in the red type. You know, for people using chainsaws, lawnmowers, they do have smaller ones like 5 and 10 liters. But the typical jerry can is 25 liters, and 
tidy tanks in the back of trucks. There's a whole range of different sizes. Um, a common size in British Columbia is 440 litres because the Transportation of Dangerous Goods Act um, changes a lot of the procedures for labelling and makes them harder once you get a container over 450 litres. So they make a lot of 440 ones that don't fall into those more, um, more stringent regulations with like placards, dangerous goods placards and stuff like that. Um, but you can get huge tanks. You can get like 2,000 litre jerry uh, tidy tanks in the back of trucks. Never ever put a type of fuel in the wrong color thing. Like even if you've got, like say you're going on a gas run and you want a bunch of gas for camp and you've got one yellow jerry can in the truck, don't put gas in it and think, well, that's okay, I'll just make sure we put a little label on it, we'll put some flagging tape on it or something. Because I've seen it happen before and somebody, you know, there's some random circumstance happens that the person who filled it isn't the person who's pouring it into equipment, the flagging rips off and somebody looks at the jerry can and they think yellow, diesel, and they pour it into a truck and they've just poured gas into a truck. So always, always, no matter what, put just use the proper color containers, please. Red for gasoline, yellow for diesel. Now that you have a good solid background on the differences between gasoline and diesel, let's look at what uh, really matters. What type of fuel do different pieces of equipment and vehicles take? Because if you don't know what the vehicle is supposed to take, then you don't know what to put in it. In general, small engines usually take gasoline. So examples would be shower pumps, fire pumps, generators, and quads. Uh, there are exceptions because I've seen bigger generators like a 6,000 watt generator that can take diesel. So double check that. Um, I have also, you also have to think about chainsaws. Mm, they're a little bit of a unique circum, uh, situation because all the other engines we've talked about so far, um, as the piston is moving in the cylinder, it's hot and so there's a lot of friction and what can happen is if it gets really hot, it can seize uh, and the piston won't move in the cylinder. That's what a seized engine is. And so you need some lubricant to make sure the piston keeps sliding up and down in the uh, cylinder. And so that's where oil comes in, motor oil. And so most of these pieces of equipment, like generators have a separate oil reservoir, quads have a separate oil reservoir, pumps have separate oil reservoirs. If you run uh, an engine without oil, generally it will seize, it will destroy the engine. Okay, a chainsaw is a bit unique because it doesn't have a compartment for motor oil. Uh, it does have an oil compartment, but don't be fooled, that is, a, it's not motor oil, it's a different type of oil called bar oil, and that is to lubricate the chain as it goes around the bar, but to, to make sure that you don't um, seize the engine on a chainsaw, it uses mixed gasoline instead of straight gas. And so what you have to do is you have to add a certain type, a certain amount of oil. There's a special oil for this too. It's like two cycle oil, chainsaw oil um, is the type that you want to add. You don't add just normal motor oil to mix fuel for a chainsaw. Anyway, generally you add it so it's 1 50th of the amount of gas. That's how much oil you have to put in. 50 to 1 ratio. So if you had a 25 liter jug of gasoline, 1 50th of that is half a liter. So you want to put in 500 milliliters of two-stroke oil, chainsaw oil, to, um, to, to, to adjust this gasoline. So you've got mixed gas. And then as that mixed gas burns in the chainsaw, in the cylinder, the gas burns off, but the oil kind of lubricates the piston automatically, as it all happens. Anyway, aside from that, uh, most small engines, this was the point, most small engines take gasoline. And with a bigger engine like a truck, you might have a gas truck, you might have a diesel truck. So the main thing to know is with vehicles, usually every smart planting company will have a sticker right beside the fuel intake on a vehicle that says either gas only or diesel only. So even if you have no idea what goes in, you'll know. And uh, you know, some people say that they can always tell by the sound of the engine. Well, that's, yeah, that's a good point. You usually can, especially with older trucks, but with some of the uh, newer trucks, 
the engines are designed so they, they're starting to sound more and more similar sometimes with a really new diesel. It's starting to almost sound like a gas truck, so be careful. Just make sure you know what has to go into it. Um, if you, you put gasoline into a diesel truck, it happens all the time. It's happened at several companies that I've worked for, and it can cost a lot of money. I actually did it once. Um, at, a, at the curd lock in Prince George, they changed the pumps during the summer. I'd been working outside in Alberta most of the summer. I came back, didn't even think, I just went to the pump I was always using and uh, filled up the truck. And as I had it almost full, I was staring at it, and I thought, why does this say gasoline? This is a diesel. Anyway, turned out that they, I went in and asked, turned out that they had changed the, uh, the pump over the summer. And so, luckily I had noticed, and so I got the truck towed to a dealership, they drained the tank, cleaned it out, so I only paid about $500 for repairs for training the tank, instead of ten or fifteen or twenty thousand dollars for a new engine. Anyway, injectors, about two thousand dollars each if you have to replace them, and with a with a one-ton truck, say you've got a 450 or a 550, you're usually looking at like ten injectors, maybe eight, ten, twelve injectors, whatever. So it can be very expensive if you uh, if you put gas into a diesel truck and try to drive it. If you ever think you've done that, stop it immediately. Um, same same problem with water. If you get a lot of water in a truck for some reason, the water and fuel light comes on in a diesel. Be very careful. You can really screw up an engine. Let's take a look at some fuel that's been contaminated by water. Actually, uh, we're going to look at a clip right now. And this is a mix of gasoline and water, and it came from one of the camp generators, which of course we toasted. And the reason, what happened was somebody left the cap off after filling it, or they went to start to fill it and maybe couldn't find gas and forgot that the lid was off. Anyway, lid stayed off overnight. It rained, and somebody else must have put the lid back on, and they tried to run it, and there was a ton of water in it. So, uh... So you can see by shaking, you know, as the jug shaking, you can see how much water is in here. This is ridiculous. So always, always, always make sure lids go back on equipment, and they go back on tidy tanks after you've used them. Um, quite often you don't have to take the lid off a tidy tank to get gas or fuel or diesel out of it, but you have to take the lid off to fill it. Uh, and also with fuel barrels in camp. If you've got fuel barrels, um, usually there's a pump that screws into the top of the barrel. People think that those are waterproof. The, the seal, unfortunately, is not usually that waterproof. And so if it rains and all this water collects on the lid of the barrel, it may, look, may not look like it's running into the fuel barrel. But what happens sometimes is these barrels expand and contract as the temperature changes. During the day, it gets hot and uh, expands. And then at night, it contracts when it gets cold. And so if you've got water on a barrel that's warm during the day, and at night it starts to contract, then basically what's happening is the fuel inside is what's contracting. It's creating a vacuum, so the sides of the barrel want to come in, but if that seal at the top is not really good, it'll suck moisture in through the seal. Okay, so if I've got a fuel barrel, I never want to see people using the pump and then leaving the pump over in the top of the barrel. I'd rather see the pump actually taken out entirely and a proper cap screwed in. Um, it's, it's sometimes a smart idea to put a small rock size of an orange under one side of the barrel so that the barrel tips enough and you just make sure the part that's up highest on the barrel is where the cap is. That way if rain does land on the top it's not around that seal. Um, a better idea is to take the pump out entirely, replace the cap, and then put some sort of cover over the top of the barrel so rain can't even hit the barrel. And one last thing I should point out is that uh, with red jerry cans, I've occasionally seen first year planters try to buy one of those to use as a water container. Bad idea. You can't do that um, for two reasons. First of all, it's just stupid because what happens if you've got your red water, your red jerry can out there, it's full of water and a foreman doesn't realize that's uh, what's in it. He thinks it's one of the company's gas jerry cans, and he goes and pours uh, water into a truck or into a quad and screws up the engine. Okay, so first of all, you're not allowed to have red jerry cans as water jugs for that reason, but also WorkSafe BC prohibits those red 
jugs being from being used as water containers. Uh, I guess possibly because um, there's the chance that somebody could take a jug of real gas, think it's water, and drink it. Uh, but also because it's not a food grade plastic. So if you drink anything out of it, it's uh, you're gonna get plastic in you basically. Um, so don't use red jerry can as a water jug or a yellow jerry can as a water jug. Um, I think that's all I have to say about fuels, really. Uh, if everyone in the industry understands what I've just talked about, I think we're going to see a lot less, uh, a reduced number of incidents with the wrong fuel being put into equipment. So if you, there should only be a designated driver fueling his own vehicle or her own vehicle. Uh, it shouldn't be just anybody fuels vehicles up all the time. If you are fueling something and you're not the person who normally does that, Make sure you understand what type of fuel does have to go in it. If you're not 100% certain, go ask somebody who does know. And finally, remember to always replace the caps on jerry cans, on tidy tanks, and on fuel barrels once you're done with them. Okay, thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it.